Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to present my paper, The Political Economy of the AIB here. And thank you very much for the HKUST to give me this op opportunity to present and to attend this conference. Um, um, as uh, Adina just uh, presented uh, to talk about the AIB in, uh, and uh, she digs uh, um, deeply into the lending process of the AIB and uh, what China did in this uh, process. My paper is uh, well like in a general analysis of the uh, AIB in, in the perspective of geopolit geopolitics. So maybe there's there's some like uh, overlap in the information of the AIB, and I apologize to repeat it. <laughs> As one of uh, one of the important components of the One Belt One Road initiative of Chinese government, the creation of the AIB attracted popular international attention. So I will first uh, introduce. Uh, um, Briefly introduce what is the, what is the what is the AIB. The AIB is the abbreviation of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, uh, it was first initiated by China in uh, October 2013 at the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, and commenced its operations in January 2013 uh, 2016. As of April 2019, the AIB totally has 97 members in which 44 from the regional, 26 from non-regional, and 27 are prospective members. Uh, as a regional multilateral bank, the AIB focuses on infrastructure investment, such as uh, rails, uh, rails, roads, and the power grids. And its priority is to financially support the developing countries in infrastructure investment, especially the countries in Asia area. Um, uh, as to the AIB, um, oh sorry, I want, I forgot to show this uh, this this chart of AIB founding member signatories. Uh, as for the AIB, um, the popular this um, the popular explanation. Um, as to the AIB, scholars often use the functionalist institutionalism to explain its emergence. Based on this theory, uh, theoretical um, perspective, it is assumed that uh, international organizations enable joint gains. So if states uh, experience bargaining failure of an international regime, they will seek for other alternatives. In this respect, the creation of the AIB reflects the efforts of China and other developing countries to establish a more efficient and responsive institu institutions. Um, from this chart, we can see that uh, um, there's, there's a huge financing gap in infrastructure investment in Asia and in, uh, in other developing countries. Accord according to the analysis of one World Bank economist, the developing countries may need an annual investment of $819 billion to prevent further economic decrease. In addition, a report from the ADB in 2017 referred that Asia may need $22.6 trillion investment between 2016 and 2030 to maintain its economic growth as well as to eradicate the poverty. Um, some like, yeah. um, uh, However, on the other hand, in reality, due to the declining lending capacities and the, the low efficiencies of the existing multilateral um, develop, development banks, such as the World Bank, the IMF, and the ADB, uh, they cannot satisfy the growing demand in infrastructure investment in Asia and in other areas. For example, data from the OECD shows that the total official support for infrastructure um, projects was $60 billion in 2013. And uh, as the largest uh, provider of development uh, support for infrastructure financing, the World Bank can only afford $11.7 billion in, in this area. In this regard, from the functionalist perspective, uh, the creation of the AIB is a response uh, to the inefficiencies of existing international financial system. Uh, it is said that uh, 
It is said that in addition to its initial subscribed paid in capital of $100 billion, the AIB could achieve a um, portfolio of around 120 billion by 2025. This, this, this amount is larger than any other regional MDBs. Moreover, functionalist explanation also suggests that the creation of the AIB reflects the dissatisfaction of the global south to the slow, uh, um, slow reform process in established MDBs, as well as uh, reflect their efforts to establish a more efficient and responsive institutions in the field of multilateral development finance. However, functional, um, functionalist explanation only tells one story of the AIB. In order to better understand uh, the emergence of the AIB, it's necessary to bring other power-based uh, um, other power-based theoretical analysis. In my paper, I will um, I will um, introduce the other power-based theory that is uh, distributive institutionalism. Um, according to this theory, the international organizations reflect the interests of powerful states, and uh, the creation of the Chinese-led AIB indicates that there is a mismatch between material and institutional power. It is argued after decades of economic uh, um, growth, China now is the second largest uh, economy in the world. However, uh, China is uh, dissatisfied with the disequilibrium between its uh, uh, grow, uh, growing economic power and its uh, like a low uh, political stand in international uh, system. Um, moreover, from the perspective, perspective of the Chinese government, most of the influential international economic organizations, such as the World Bank and the IMF, uh, they are dominated by the U.S.-led Western countries. In that situation, China, it's difficult for China to seek more influence in these established um, organizations. For example, in 2010, the U.S.-led transnational power bloc had basically rejected the Chinese application through its blocking uh, of an upgrade in China's standing in the IMF. In that situation, China will inevitably to seek for other alternatives to reconfigure the game board. Um, the way it will use is such like uh, um, to establish in the new regional or global institutions in which China can play a new distribution of power and prestige. In light of this, uh, I assume that the creation of the AIB reflects China's such effort. Um, that is, through the AIB, the China could act as an institution builder or rule makers instead of, inter uh, instead of rule followers in the international society. Uh, it is argued that it not only helped China to get out of the shadow of the U.S.-dominated economic world order, but also it will help China to leverage its, uh, its economic rise into political capital throughout, uh, through, the, through, establishing new and, uh, through establishing new regional and global networks. Um, here's, uh, here's a chart. Uh, we can see from the chart that uh, actually the chi China is in control of the AIB. It is said that China is the largest shareholder of the AIB, uh, which maintains about 28% uh, of voting share. And compare with the second largest uh, AIB member state, India, who only had 8% of the voting share. Uh, it's very striking that the disparity in the voting share of the AIB. Uh, this uh, illustrates that the AIB act is actually in the control, in the control of the of Chinese government, uh, in in which China could uh, play uh, could maximize its uh, influences and uh, interests. In this regard, explanations from the distributive institutionalism help us better understand how power politics works behind China's initiation of this regional multilateral bank. Um, in, addition to anal uh, 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 in addition to the analysis of China's motivation to initiate the AIB, 
the, res uh, the analysis uh, on the responses to the AIB from other uh, state uh, members also shows how power politics works. Um, for example, the, the, the U.S., its firmly resistance to the AIB reflect uh, U.S. vigilance to China's rise. For the U.S. government, the Chinese-led AIB is a self-serving institution uh, designed to enhance China's regional and global influence and to help China gaining more access, uh, access to the raw materials at the, ex at the expense of the U.S. So in this regard, this new multilateral bank uh, challenges the U.S. domination in the world and harms its uh, um, vested interest Vested interests, especially in the uh, in the area of Asia, um, as to the other developing uh, Asia developing countries who are member of the AIB, the emergence of the AIB provides them uh, uh, alternatives to get more financial support in infrastructure investments. Most importantly, it offers them another platform to counterbalance the U.S. control in international society and gain much more represent, uh, representations. Um, as to the U.S. Western allies, um, they uh, choose to join the AIB or not to reflect their um, strategic struggle or consideration between political and economic interests. On the one hand, as the most important partners of the U.S., these U.S. these U.S. Western allies have to rely on the U.S. backup to safeguard their um, material, uh, territorial or economic uh, um, security. On the other hand, they are attracted by the huge market uh, and interest in China and in other developing countries. For example, it is reported that China and the Europe now trade well over one, one billion euro dollars a day, and the size of China's consumer market will reach around 41.2 trillion dollars, which is about 92% of the corresponding U.S. market in 2020. Uh, in addition to these economic, economic interests, the U.S. Western allies also want to shape the AIB toward a rule-based uh, rule organization through, through engagement from within. In, uh, in light of this consideration, most of the U.S. Western allies, except Japan, choose to join the AIB, even under the U.S. pressure. Um, so. Here comes my conclusion. Uh, to better understand the creation of the AIB and the power politics behind it, it's better to use the functionalist institutionalism and the other power-based uh, uh, theoretical analysis, the distributive institutionalism, to uh, explain its emergence. Um, and uh, it is ho even right now the AIB cannot. It's difficult for it to develop into a um, if, um, regional organizations such as the ADB or the. Never, it is hoped in the future that it will grow up to the influential institutions, um, due to the Chinese strong will to develop it, and uh, due to the uh, huge demand in infrastructure investment. And another, the last point I want to mention is that uh, for the U.S., it seems that the recent behavior of the Chinese government are very assertive under the Xi Jinping's administration. However, uh, it's possible that China and its domestic uh, elites know that they are benefiting from the existing international economic order. Uh, and they know that a moderate and uh, cooperative attitude and approach with the West will best serve, serve China's interests. So in this, that sense, um, it is recommended that instead of trying to isolate and contain or confront, confront with China, it's better for the U.S. to engage with China and encourage it participating in the rule-based world order as a constructive players. That's my paper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.